was actually to have Mark at the meeting. He usually doesn't attend uh, ITF meetings. So if we were wanting to meet, he had to be there. So that's the reason for which we had this, this meeting here. So. Yeah. Um, funnily, I did a similar assessment like he did last year, but only with the, so for every Alexis web, uh, enabled domain, I, I looked for name server, mail exchange, and web server, and only where both, so IPv4 and IPv6 address was available, I counted these, in, but there I only tested the top 2,500 uh, ones, which came from the list. Um, and these were my results last year. So he has newer, newer values. Um, there is quite a difference that I found. For example, I, I just looked for management ports because that was something I was interested in, like VNC, RDP, SSH, and Telnet. Um, and from the servers, you can see this is 0.1%. And here you have something like 0.6%. So it's five times, basically five times more. Um, when getting to SSH, 3% were open, so that's why I was surprised with the 50%. Um, only 3% had on IPv4 had SSH enabled, but 5% on IPv6. Uh, so um, you'll find that in the, in the slides from um, Hack in the Box Malaysia in 2012. You can download that. It's one of many, many, many slides in there. So, and then what I also did um, I tested all the routers on the path to those servers. So I did a trace route to every server on IPv4 and IPv6 and did the same for the routers on the path. Um, yeah, and what is really funny that on IPv6, 6 to 7% have Telnet enabled, uh, not Telnet and SSH enabled. And if you just count Telnet only, 7% on IPv6. I mean, all these devices have SSH for years. They have IPv6, but they still enable Telnet. It's kind of totally weird. Yeah. So he, there I also found last year that what the ISPs are doing is less security on IPv6 than compared to IPv4. So missing ACLs. So that was actually not what I planned for the presentations, but I thought, oh, I'm speaking directly after him. I can show you what I found last year. Okay, um, Okay. who here knows my THC IPv6 toolkit? Hands up. Okay, um, wonderful. So, I'm Mark, hi. Um, the initial, I just want to talk actually just for five or ten minutes, that's basically it. In all the times I was the only one talking about IPv6 and it was always boring. Now there are so many people doing IPv6 I don't need to be on stage and talking so much anymore. So um, that's why I will not talk that much today. Um, the initial slides are just for basic documentation because 60 tools is a lot. Yeah. Um, so if you ever looked about, okay, what's in the toolkit, then pff, yeah, even I forget what I have in tools in there. Um, so several tools for live scanning, for DNS enumeration, for local discovery, so neighbor solicitation, um, lookup stuff, sniffing, a trace router, and some helper tools. Lots of men in the middle um, tools. And of course, the majority of the part is Nano service because that's so easy in IPv6. Um, even here, 50% can kill any firewall. You, you would be running on IPv6. That right? no, no, doesn't matter. Because this is not TC well, there is one TCP tool, but everything else is um, ICMP or um, extension header related. So it doesn't matter if a firewall is stateful or not, because it is on a local LAN mostly. Um, so lots of tools for that. Um, several testing tools for testing implementation, testing firewalls, testing fragmentation, etc., and some more tools. So just for documentation purposes. Um, yeah, when I thought about, okay, what could I tell you people? Um, there is one thing in which I implemented in the toolkit end of last year, which is kind of special, and there is no other tool in the world which can do that. And um, it's interesting, because you can inject into um, Q VLANs, into six in four tunnels, and in PPP over Ethernet. 
Um, for example, you can spend something like $200,000 for code Nomicon to test IPv6 and ICMP version 6, really, really expensive modules, but they can't do that. So um, I got hired several times by large, large ISPs to test their DSL setup because all the other tools could not test that. And so I implemented that for that. Um, yeah, so if you want to test first hop security on a DSL environment, this is actually what you need. Um, so this is the usual setup. You have the CPs or the wireless LAN router, usually together with the DSL modem. Then there is some magic in between with the DSLAM and then it's the BRAS and the BRAS is the first IP next hop seen from the, um, from the, from the v, um, wireless LAN router. So you have different protocols and PPPoE is talked usually by the CP, so wireless LAN router to the um, BRAS. These are very, very large routers by Cisco, Huawei, Ericsson, Juniper and so on. Big, big and loud and yeah. So how you can do that? Um, what you can do in, in any ISP setup you have, DSL setup at, set at home, as this is usually one device, you just separate them to two devices. Put in a hub here and put your laptop here. And then you can attack the BRAS router on linked local addresses, FE80. Otherwise, you have no way on attacking that unless you would run your tests from your, from your DSL router. So this is what the purpose is of this feature. Um, how you do that is pretty easy. You just set environment variables. And then everything is done in the background in the tools. So they see, okay, these environment variables are set, so the tools automatically do the injection for you. Um, same for VLAN, so for example, some have also um, internet TV. For that, they have different VLANs over the um, PPUE. And then you need also this feature. Yeah, this is how you can get the information what the um, VLAN ID would be, for example, what the PPOE session ID would be, which is, well, otherwise it doesn't work. And if you, if you want to attack, attack six in four tunnels, this is how you find the source and destination IP address plus Ethernet addresses. Yeah, if you run the tools, they print this information so you see, okay, injection is actually happening because a few times I did that I did it in the wrong window and I was wondering why things were not working. So that's why I added it so I can actually see I'm running it in the right window. Um, yeah. There's another tool which checks if the configuration changes. Because if you test a BRAS, it might be that your PPE's, PPOE session is disconnected because your overload, CPU problems whatsoever. Um, or some security triggers and then your PPOE session is disconnected. And if you don't detect that, you're sent with the old PPOE session and just going nowhere. So this is a tool which checks if the PPOE session ID changes. And if so, it warns you and tells you this is a new session ID and then you adapt your environment variable, rerun the tool and continue. Yeah, there are several tools, of course, which won't work simply because they don't make any sense on injected sessions. For example, Parasite, where you would see neighbor solicitation request and answer with fake neighbor advertisement request doesn't make any sense on PPOE because there, there is no such traffic. Um, so some of these tools actually work there, but it just makes no sense. Um, there is more information in a text file which goes into more detail. Okay, so just so you know, this feature because this can help you a lot if you do security testing on devices in weird environments or unusual environments. Mark, yes? That was in the last release? Of the that, was, that was already in the 2.3 release I did around Christmas. Okay. Oh. Uh, 2.1 release, sorry. Um, so, I'm already working, of, of course, on the next release. I can already tell you what will be in the next release because that's already there, but I plan on more. There's a new tool, Flood Redirect, which just floods redirects to a target. Um, 
So basically nothing special. The special stuff is that if you have a Cisco device, it has huge problems with that. Um, so this 10 to 35% traffic loss is actually on high-end Cisco routers, the ASR 9K, which, which are the high-end, very big routers. Um, yeah, where you can connect something like several thousand customers to. Yeah? And for several thousand customers, they get 10 to 35% traffic loss. So this is kind of devastating. Already reported, <laughs> <laughs> it's already reported to PSIRT. So the Cisco um, emergency response team, they already have a bug ID for that, etc. Et so the fix shouldn't be that far away. But, so you, you would expect operators to throw this away, right? Yes. If they were doing their jobs. Yeah. If they do their jobs and, well, you would do that on the BRAS, you would have an ACL already preventing what, what the router should actually receive and process as, tra as traffic. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an ICMP redirect to a router? Nah. From the customer side? No, no, no. You wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. And this is also from my last project I did, something very new state of the art. You know, if you have an IPv6 network and you have an IPv4 network in between, you tunnel, or you can tunnel with um, six to four. Um, and that environment I was assessing it was the opposite because it was IPv6 only network and they wanted to connect IPv4 clouds. So it was four to six, the opposite. Uh, and um, because they did some security there, so you needed the right addresses and stuff, so I can test stuff. Um, this is actually a tool to test that. Um, here you can send IPv4 packets over an IPv6 network. So this is what this tool is for. Um, yeah, then the Alive tool, that's something, well, if you have someone else competing with you on tools, it's always helpful because it makes both toolkits better. So um, Fernando implemented in his last version, in his scanner, um, the option that you supply an IPv4 address with a net mask. And then if you scan an IPv6 address space, the IPv4 addresses are encoded as in the local, local address part and see if this is an alive valid address. And this is the same um, for my Alive 6 tool. So you, with the dash 4 option, you will supply just the IPv4 address and that's it. Um, of course, only the local part. You can find IPv4 addresses encoded in the, uh, in the index. In the, well, in, 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 in the yeah, but h how you would apply that is different. That's yeah, totally how different how you, how you apply that. This is, you already know this is a slash 64 I want to scan. Uh -huh. uh, and for that, various, so this is encoded in various ways, like in hexadecimal and decimal. Um, only the last part or the whole address, etc. So, so it does some permutation and tries these on the on the addresses. Um, then the flat router 2.6 tools, I'll make it more effective, so even more effective, so you can really kill everything. Um, so supporting now 64 kilobyte packets through fragmentation, obviously. Um, yeah, some more tricks and stuff faster packet generation, etc., to make it more effective. So, and some other fixes and enhancements for Tray6, Parasite6, um, for example, Parasite6, I had kind of a bug, or missing feature, I would call it, because if you spoof a neighbor advertisement packet, but the neighbor advertisement packet you were, you're spoofing would be the, the local router, and you don't put the R flag in the neighbor advertisement, that router is removed from, um, from the routing entry. So this way you can make anybody on the local network lose their, lo their default gateway. This is of course not what you want if, when you, if you want to do man in the middle. Um, so feature. For me it was a bug. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so this is for example fixed. And I did some more test cases for fragmentation. For example, fragmentation sex. I now have test cases for multi-level Fragmentation. So you have fragments, which if you defragment, build another fragment, which is then part of another fragment stream, which if you re um, reassemble then put another fragment which belongs to a different fragment stream. Yeah, so it's something totally weird. And then see which operating systems can work with that and stuff. Surprisingly many, actually. 
yeah, stuff like that. Um, yeah, actually, and that's why I wanted to talk here. Um, when I'm in my closet, you know, underground, no sunlight, yeah, um, everything's black, and I'm in front of my old screen monitor typing stuff, you know, like that. Um, I code stuff I think is necessary, yeah, but that's just me. As most of you have used my tools, my question for you is now, what features are missing? What tools would you say are required? So how can, can I expand on the toolkit to make it better, more complete, whatever? Yes, please. Pardon? Big Indian? Okay. Support for big Indian systems, you said? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with, with different And uh, uh, Actually, that would... Hmm. Might be a bug, I guess. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's that would be a bug. That, that's yeah. Big Indian support. Weird, I haven't thought of that. I thought 64-bit, and actually I also already did that, so it does 64-bit, no problem. Yeah, most tools will be, so it's also the central library which will be affected by that. Okay. Mark, if you could do what you just did and repeat the question. That okay, did. sorry. No, um, he recom... You, you did it. Okay. More or less. Wow, I already did. Mm. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Ideas? What, is, what are attacks which would be interested to have a tool to test for? I mean, that's the first thing. You, you have to imagine, okay, there could be this security issue. Then you code, the, you implement that, and then you try if this security issue is actually present on devices. Yes, I have an idea. Me? I'm not sure if it fits in, in their toolkit. I'm not going to implement any time soon, so I'm giving the idea. Uh, if, uh, if it's good, I would copy it yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have some tools, for example, to, uh, to pipe TCP traffic or the like? Uh, with uh, IDS evasion techniques, for example, uh, overlapping fragments, maybe overlapping TCP segments, and so on. I don't know if uh, there's stuff like that for IPv6. There certainly is for IPv4, but not yeah. for v6. Yeah, that's true. I also know of, well, there is one TCP port scanner which has something like 16, 17 extensionators in between because then some older version of Snort can't see the TCP port scan anymore. Uh, yeah, but okay. what if, for example, you want, what I mean is that uh, if you want to do that, but not just with a single packet, when you want to transfer data, for example, yeah, yeah. which means that you should be able to, for example, establish a TCP connection mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. It's a lot of work, or it's probably a lot of work, but uh, that's something that I think could be interesting. I haven't found yeah, anything yeah. like that. Well, I have one tool which does that f um, for if you want to if you just want to get data out of a network through a firewall um, where you can put in a destination extension header, you can put the data in there and just the like at the destination on the internet, yeah. it just gets all the data out and it's also AES encrypted. So even if you put, look for keywords, it doesn't, it's not detected, but not for full TCP session. So uh -huh. actually, yeah, that would be an interesting test tool. As also, as far as I know, nobody so far has tested IDS for how to bypass that in IPv6. I know lots of them for IPv4. Mm -hmm. Lots of people did that on 1997 Pacek, but even a few years ago, so several people have done that, but not for IPv6. I would also assume that the IDS are not really able to fully do IPv6 so far. Maybe snort f for some parts. Yeah. And thankfully for the project, the people here in the University of Potsdam did um, there is some modules for SNORT for the IPv6 local attacks. Yes? Mark Antonius did some stuff, and uh, if I recall correctly, he was able to bypass uh, or evade SNORT um, with some specific. Uh, he had a set of uh, kind of signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this, um, uh, and then there was uh, this, this Paxson um, base. Uh, yeah, I remember that. One Paxson, some, some papers with some one. Um, uh, based stuff and, and uh, if I recall correctly, he, he could await uh, both Snort and another one um, in the open uh, in the open source space um, by specific 
But was that, for example, for detect for avoiding detection of scanning attack or, or yes. stuff like that, or no, for it, transfer yeah, it information? Yeah, it's more effective. Uh, say uh, signatures that would otherwise uh, have been detected okay. uh, once you um, uh, modify the payload by uh, say adding uh, a fragmentation and uh, extension headers. Uh, it was able to bypass mm -hmm. to evade um, uh, IDS detection. Mm -hmm. And we are, uh, there will be another student at UNW who is going to write his um, thesis uh, starting in November on exactly this for six months. Okay, uh, nice. Commercial year. Cool. Okay, nice idea. Thank you. I will blatantly steal it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, yes. I have a stupid question. It's prob probably stupid, so don't hate me. There are no stupid uh, questions. I'm just wondering the, the tools. Most of them craft some packets to send. Mm -hmm. uh, are they aware of prefix changes and then adapt the, the network part? So when you run them for a long time and then you, maybe a provider sends you a prefix change, a prefix delegation, will, the, will it still craft packets? With the depends on the tool, depends on how it's implemented in the tool, depends on the function which is basically used. So for some okay, function so for speed, no, you, it's 60 tools. <laughs> um, no, the thing is, for example, for speed, for example, for the flooding stuff, I get all the data in the beginning and then just reuse that data because getting the data every time is just speed loss. You don't want that. Um, for other stuff, well, I don't have tools which you would run for that long. Um, but otherwise, it's just... Um, Actually, to implement it, it's so easy. You just remove code, and that's basically it, how to do that. Because then defaults are used, and then the defaults are taken every time yeah. the basic uh, generate my packet function is called. Yeah? And then every time, so what's the, the, now the, the right IP address to use? Mm -hmm. So actually, you would just remove code, not add code well, for that. It would be better to run a parallel tool that just observes this and then kicks the generator in the box to restart it? Mm. Mm. it what I try to avoid is complexity. Mm. If you have something like that, you add a lot of complexity in there. Yeah, no? um, but I'll make a note on... To have a separate tool that just wants you, then take care. Maybe you can just respond to hang up signal. What do you mean? Sorry? I have a signal handler. Just kill minus one, you get the uh, hang up signal. Uh, you can make the detection separate and yeah. then automate whatever mm -hmm. you want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make a note down, I'll have to think about it. Yeah. If that makes sense and if yes, how to do that and or for which tools that would make sense. I mean, for for local LAN only, so for top security tools, of course, it doesn't make sense. They no. would, they <laughs> you wouldn't care about any prefix changes, yeah, but, but everything which is goes over that's a which with needs global prefixes. Yeah, then something like a ZCAP or so might be cool. Mm -hmm. I'll have to think about it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I haven't thought about that. Yes? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned 64. Yeah, you mentioned 64. Uh, in fact, in ITF, there is a factor of transition technologies which in that before addressed here and there or run before on top of the 66. Loader. Loader. Huh? Lo loader. Louder. Yeah, louder. <laughs> so there's tons of different transition technologies which run V4 mm -hmm. on top of V6, V6 on top of V4, embed parts of V4 addresses as part of V6 address, embed parts of V6 addresses as part of V4 address, and so et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. then you need to enforce this relationship on a particular set of gateways. So I think having something like that would be interesting to be able to force scan. Within the protocol, to ensure that the restrictions that the protocol puts mm -hmm. on embedding are met, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. preventing mm -hmm. some kind of spoofing when you put one protocol inside the other, and that kind of stuff. That I think that's what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. You mean, for example, for for the four to six, also say do it TCP packet and do it for this destination port, and then see if something comes back. Yes, actually, uh, that's already partially implemented, but so it's actually not that much work. Yes? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, like, yeah, I'll finish it. Yeah. Um, if you have any more ideas, just email me or talk to me. I'm always happy for ideas and stuff to add or fix and stuff. Um, this is 
also on my roadmap. So do some more fuzzers and um, make the DHCP v6 fake server having more options. Um, yeah. So, and if anyone wants to code something himself and have it in the toolkit, just do it and send it to me and I'll just add it. No problem. So, um, yeah, blah. Enjoy. Thank you. I'll hand over to you.